Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'll I'm gonna call roll just in time for Charles to be uh, attendant, and we'll confirm a quorum before we're planning to go into closed session. So, uh, Commissioner Montgomery here. Commissioner McCullough here. Commissioner Smith here. Commissioner Dean here. Commissioner Miller here. Commissioner Evans here. Commissioner Ortiz here. Commissioner Ines Osario absent. Okay. Um, for the purposes of consulting with council, I move that Arlington County Law Enforcement Community Oversight Board convene a closed meeting for the purposes of consulting with council as authorized by the Virginia Code Section 2.23711.A.19 for briefings by law enforcement officials or council uh, and for discussion of information subject to the exclusion in Virginia Code Section 2.23705.2, Subdivision 14C under the Freedom of Information Act. Conflict of Interest Act and other applicable laws concerning the board's duties and liabilities. Do I have a second? I second that motion. Excellent. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. We will go into closed session <clears throat> and then call the meeting back to order.
So we come out of closed session before we come out of closed sessions. <laughs> I move that the members of the Arlington County Law Enforcement Community Oversight Board certify that at the just concluded session, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under Chapter 37, Title 2.2 of the Code of Virginia, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. Do I have a second? All in favor say aye. 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 All aye. Aye. The abstentions. Gonna call the motion passes. Okay. So our next um, agenda item is to approve the meeting minutes from May 10th. Up on the slide, just so we can you. Uh, does anyone have any known issues with meeting minutes? Okay. Um, and then after that, we're gonna. Question. In order, motion to second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all aye. Say aye. The abstentions. Wonderful. Meeting minutes from May 10th are approved. And we will move on to complaint and take mini training. So the purpose of this was we did want to um, just make sure that everyone is comfortable receiving complaints. And we walk through sort of what the system is, but um, uh, actually, I think we talked about getting access to the beta version so that folks could offline practice taking in a complaint. Yeah, so we could use the test version um, for the purposes of our example on the The only caveat with that is you would have to register yourself for the test site. And if you want to complete, then you can come back to our page. Okay. But since it would be the first time, you can Okay. So, um, and is that on the same page? Like, yeah, so it's, it's the same page portal that the public would see, except it's an internal. So we won't create a bunch of actual, actual plans yeah. by registering them, but it gives us all direct access to the site so that we can, for example, practice that, you know, right. I get an email from a community member, she wants to meet and talk, I can help them yeah. on board. Everyone feels comfortable doing that. So um, we just wanted to very quickly um, go through just kind of the complete basic 101 that um, doing complete mistakes should you happen to be and someone asks you to walk them um, So the goals again are to familiarize POV members with practices and assessment of their intake. Um, to review the functions of civil software and to familiarize POV members with tools of IPA setup um, to track complaints and share. Um, so we'll cover complaint intake principles, utilizing the civil system, 
we'll review a sample complaint um, and then we will do, I'll, I'll go over what the complaint tracking spreadsheet um, looks like in terms of format and how you can utilize it to find out the claims. And then we'll talk about decrease in our um, So just in general, we want to um, try to utilize these different practices when we are doing some updates. Um, the best kind of practice here is to direct complainants to the civil website. That allows us to make sure that um, the information that is being relayed to us is uploaded into our system, that we're able to track the data, that we're able to easily share it, and that is coming directly from that person and they can certify the information. Also, civil has a feature where you can um, change the language. So if you have people that have a language barrier, or something like that, that would be the best way for them to be able to go in and implement or input that information. Um, that being said, there are people who you know, may not have access to the technology or prefer to talk to someone in person or over the phone or you know, just various different things. So we want to still be able to address that um, need if, if people don't want to use civil. But if someone does come to you with a physical intake form, which is a physical form um, that mirrors what someone would on the civil website, or they just send an email because we've gotten complaints that have been forwarded to us and other agencies, um, or someone might call over the phone or schedule it in person. What we would do with that is then take that information and input it into civil ourselves so that we always have some system that we go back to that has all of the, the information. Um, we can assign it to people, and also it's important for tracking data. So when a member of the public goes to that kind of data interface portion of civil, we're able to like make sure that our numbers are um, you know, consistent with the number of cases that we're investigating. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, how to input that information into civil and what kind of things we want to upload um, to kind of like authenticate or just archive you know, the original documents that we received so that anybody can go back and make sure that Everything we put into civil mirrors exactly what we received. The voicemail that we got to or what have you. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, another key thing is that you want to um, be detailed. So sometimes people will give you kind of very um, concise uh, summaries of what happened because they think that you want you know to want you that we want them to just get to the point. Um, so you may have to you know get that person to kind of unpack a little bit more and give you more details or explain things um, in a more um, detailed manner. So you just want to, you know, thinking about getting as many details as possible. Um, obviously, being respectful is really important. Um, customer service is the, the heart of this. Um, mindful that people's experiences um, might have been traumatic for them. So, just, you know, just be mindful of that when we're talking about it and having those sensitivities. Be mindful of any sort of language or cultural differences. Um, and then also just, you know, informing them that this is a uh, confidential process. If they wish to, you know, submit it to complaint anonymously, they're absolutely empowered to do so. And that, you know, as we talked about, there's, we're not going to be um, releasing their names or personally identifiable information. Um, then the last part is just explaining the process. So letting them know, you know, I'm going to take this information, it's going to go into our system, and then we're going to share that information with ACPD, we're going to engage in a collaborative investigation, IPA will produce a report, we'll produce a report, just letting them know kind of what happens after they receive this, um, and what to expect, you know, throughout the process. Um, so then to go into civil a little bit more to uh, kind of make sure that we're all aware of what that process looks like. Um, the community member would go to the civil website and then they have the option to select complaint, compliment, review request, or a recommendation. Um, a review request is something that may have already been investigated administratively by ACPD. Um, it has to still be within uh, two years for the ordinance, but it, it's something that we could go back and review if it's already been done, so retroactively reviewing. And then recommendation is essentially just for them to get us recommendations on how we could do better as an oversight. Um, once the community member has input all of their information, then they'll go ahead and sign it and submit it, and then they'll get a case number, like a tracking number, and they'll be able to go in and put that tracking number in at any point to um, get case updates if they decide to create an account 
they will automatically get email updates as their case for investigation process. Do they, they get a tracking number if they don't create an account? Yes. Okay. So they'll, they'll just have to go onto the civil website and manually input the tracking number. They won't get an email. Okay. 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 That's only they don't have to do anything. <clears throat> money if they are not able to enter because they've got so many disabilities and stuff and one of us has to enter or you whatever uh, how is it tracked to them then they have to give you some kind of information like an address or how do they get up to it if they're not able to do it? so if they're not able to do it we would input it with them we would input it with them over the phone if we're like talking yep. to them in the moment and then once we submit it we would give them the tracking number um, if someone left an anonymous voicemail or something of that nature and we're just unable to give them that tracking information they are, then that just might be the case. But um, if we have some form of way to contact that person, even if they just leave their name and number at the end of the call, we can call them back or you know reach out to them and let them know. We put it into our system. Here's the tracking number. I don't want to go down that road. Just we can talk about that later. Yeah. Um, so once that happens, um, we will download the complaint as well as any attachments that come along with it, and we will then share that information with the Office of uh, Professional Responsibility. So they'll be able to um, look and see what was submitted and all of the facts. That information will then get uploaded into evidence.com, and you all will see it on your evidence.com account. If you haven't already logged in, you'll, that's what the submissions are that you see. You'll see on there both ones that come in through ATP portal as well as our portal. Um, and you'll be able to distinguish the digital portal and the top. Um, I haven't noticed that. Have we gotten into our portal yet? Because I mean, I've looked at them all, but I haven't really, maybe I just, I just missed it, but like, I'll look for where they come from. On evidence.com, yeah. it doesn't say like from civil in any sort of like major yeah. identifying yeah, 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 way. Like yeah. Embedded in it. Right. Yeah. Oh, um, I'll, I'll show you uh, um, an example of what our download is. Okay. Um, so again, for people who have given us their contact information, anonymous complaint, then we follow up with them. Um, if we need any additional, um, and then as I was talking about in the beginning, um, if someone does submit um, a complaint, or it could, it could be a compliment or a complaint, so that's why I wrote submission instead of whether it's a complaint or a compliment, um, and it's given to us in some sort of written form or email or verbally again i can't stress enough how important it is for us to put that information into civil and then whatever other document you receive from email voicemail whatever it was to attach that document to the civil so that we have a, a paper trail essentially or something to, to go back to to say that we input this information exactly as it was communicated to us and that just helps us to ensure credibility so um, I wanted to just do a practice um, complaint intake with you all, walking you through. Um, Ian is going to serve as a resource, going to serve as our um, attend complainant, and I'm going to actually go onto the site in real time and um, in okay. Oh, okay. I think I said it as Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is the, the website that you would see when you log on to um, the portal. And I'm going to hit make a complaint. And then we'll start the form. So um, for the last of rainbow, I set up an uh, appointment to come to the office. And I'm here now to uh, file the complaint. Uh, so, Mr. Osrenko, thank you so much for today to yeah. share your experience um, that you've had with uh, ATP. 
Um, I'm gonna just walk through the complaint form with you and we're gonna input all of the information in here. We'll review it together at the end to make sure that it accurately describes everything that you're relaying to me and then submit it and then we'll begin the investigation. Review what that is. Um, so my first question to you is can you talk about this anonymous group? I'm fine with my Just as a disclaimer, if, if someone says yes, um, that they do want to file anonymously, it's not going to require them to put their email address or any identifiable information. Mm -hmm. But since we said no, then email address is required because that's how it will um, send the, the update. Or we'll be able to send updates to that. So, so it won't, so those fields will be empty. Right. Perfect. So you can't make a mistake. Address, then, yeah, we, then in that case, you can email at email.com it'll allow you to keep going it won't affect the actual yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay so i spelled your first name i-a-n last name l-a-t-r-e-n-o oh, um, what's your email address uh you can reach me probably at um, i and then my last name U.S. most likely the person filing Can you provide us with the phone number to contact? Sure thing, my, you can contact me myself, uh, which is 410. And what about a student address? Um, honestly, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I'm really comfortable sharing my address. But, yeah. It's not required. I just don't want anyone visiting. Okay. Um, All right, so here's where we're going to try to um, capture the incident that happened to you in a written form. Um, so if you can be um, as descriptive as possible, give me as many details as you can. I'm going to just uh, relay in text exactly what you're thinking as you're saying it. Okay. okay. Um, so I was I was visiting a friend's house last Friday night. Um, you know, we were hanging out and everything, and I walked from his house and I was headed over to the metro afterwards. And uh, as I was walking, I decided that you know, I was going to take a shortcut through the park um, just to get to the metro quicker. And I called my dad at the same time. Uh, so I just wanted to talk to him just about family stuff. Um, my dad's from Russia, so we were speaking Russian on the phone. And as I'm walking, I was approached by two officers from ACPD. Uh, they first, you know, they asked me to stop, and they, they asked me what I was doing, why I was in the park. Um, because I was speaking on the phone, I felt like they were just really like concerned or that they were, I don't know, treating me differently because I wasn't speaking English. Uh, I think one of them made some snide comment about you know, lying or something like that, and it just made me really angry and really uncomfortable. Um, they asked me, you know, if they could search my bag and everything, and I just didn't understand why they were asking me to do that when I was just trying to walk through the metro. And they made me feel really uncomfortable and like they were targeting me. Officers asked to search your bag, and um, what was the if, if there was a reason you had with like a They just asked me why I was walking, you know, park so late, and what I had in my bag and everything. You know, I, I was maybe a little, you know, I had a couple beers or something like that, so maybe I was stumbling a little bit. But you know, I wasn't. You know, I, I didn't. I just don't know why they. You know, they didn't want me to look at my bag. So you. Um, that the reason why they asked you to search your bag was because you were walking around late at night in the park and could do something. Maybe, I, but I, you know, I, was, I don't know really what, what, why that would be a reason that I would be suspicious or anything. I'm trying to get the metro before that. Um, Do you recall, um, you said there two officers that um, you were interested Yeah, two right? officers, yeah. Um, do you recall which officer, first of all, do you know their, their name? Um, 
You know, I, I think one of their last names was Smith, I think one of them said. Okay. Uh, but I, I didn't get their name on the list. Okay, that's no problem. Um, so let's call one officer one and then the other one officer two. Okay. think that it's Officer Smith. So which officer was it that you believe made the crime? Uh, my back was turned, but I, I think it was Officer Smith because he sounded like a man and the, the other officer was a man. I believe Officer Smith was a man. I so, yeah. I was moving kind of fast too, so I didn't really look until afterwards. Okay. And then which officer asked to search your back? I don't know, actually, I don't remember. And then after your back was searched, what happened next? Uh, well, I, I I didn't let them search my back, but they you know, they, they kind of insisted on and I asked, you know, if they really needed to. And they said no, and then I, I declined to search and asked them if they really did that. And they responded no, they did not. And at that point is when the Yeah, well, I kind of ran away a little bit. I didn't want to get caught. Would that be the end of the interview? Is there anything else that you want to add to that in terms of um, it just the big hearing? It just made me feel kind of weird, like I was being seen. And when you say that you uh, felt that you were being singled out, are you referring to comments and also that? Or are you yeah, just kind of the comments, just because I was like talking to my dad and just me. Um, but I, I also was the only person. I may not have that distinction. Okay, and Um, are there any sort of um, additional documents or any sort of information related to this that you want to include along with What kind of documents? Anything that you may have um, received, any sort of correspondence from the police department, or if there was any sort of report generated that you're aware of, or um, anything that you think it might be relevant to help in any investigation? I did text you. recorded it. Well, it was the phone conversation. I hung up like midway through, but I texted um, my friend right afterwards and told him what happened. So I texted somebody. And I, I did send an email to, I couldn't find the internal affairs email, but I found the media email for the police department. So I emailed them, but I don't know if they got the email. Um, I'll give you my card after we finish up today. And if you'd like to email over to me any of those written documents and have them attached to the submission, I'd be happy to upload those into the Okay. Um, this is where you all would upload the files right here where it says upload documents. That could be a recording, it could be you know, witness statements, or if they've already brought this to the attention of anyone at APC, like let's say it was an email that they sent to someone, um, that's where we would attach the file. Or if you're putting this in for someone as a result of Call or email if you want. Well, where would we, I mean, um, how would we upload a telephone? You, you could, if it was recorded, um, then you could download it as like an MP3 or an MP4 and then upload it like as an audio file. Yeah. We've had, we've had a voicemail for what it's worth. Yeah, I know there were some voicemails in the stuff, but I mean, so they, they would have called. Just, I mean, like, if they didn't, unless they knew my number, who, how would we do that? Like, so let's say somebody calls you and they say, I want to give you a complaint over the phone. You could ask their consent to record the conversation.
presentation if you wanted to and just say, is it okay if I record this for record keeping for sure that I input your information correctly? Can you record it on your you know, laptop or your phone or whatever, the iPad that you're using? And then you would need to um, you would need to uh, upload it into the system that way. So like for example, iPhones have voice memo apps and that sort of that way. Um, in that instance, if you feel like you don't have the technology to do that, you could direct them to me or Ian as well. And well I probably have that. the technology. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. To, to do it. yeah. I mean, you could always direct them to someone else yeah. who feels more comfortable utilizing that technology. Just make it. It's it's best practice to have it recorded if the person is okay with sending it. If you it. That way, we just have something again for you to even go back to the record oh, yeah. or to authenticate. So if someone calls me on my cell phone, I can just during the call start to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're going to do it. Don't you know? 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 So um, especially in instances where someone does not have the officer's badge number, which is most of the time, um, it's, even in those cases, it's always good to get a uh, location, but especially in cases where the person doesn't have the identifiable information, how we're going to try to figure out what officers were involved by figuring out the, the date and time and the location. But, um, so going back to Mr. Lazarenko, can you tell me where this incident yeah, I was I was near East Falls Church Metro. I, I don't know which park it was, but I didn't really you know, I'm not too familiar with that part of Metro. I don't remember. Okay. Um, do you remember when this took place? It was uh, right before Metro closed, so it was it was after twelve thirty, I think. Uh, running to get there. Twelve thirty after midnight. Yeah. And do you remember what date it was? Yeah, it was the eighteenth. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, June 16th. Um, so one officer is unknown, and then the other officer you said you think was talking to the officer. Right. Unknown. Yeah. Then you think that Officer Smith was a male officer, is that correct? Yeah, he was a white male, I believe. But it was pretty dark and I, I was kind of looking at him. Um, so I know he was a male. Though. Okay. Um, male officer, um, essentially. Um, essentially white, and then um, can you describe the person that killed or stature a little bit? Um, they were taller than I am, so probably like six, 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 seven. Um, eye color, hair color, anything like that. And then the second officer, um, you said, was possibly a female officer. I, I think so, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's all I really got. Okay. No, there's a second one. Um, were there any other people who potentially witnessed the incident? I know you said that you were on the phone with your dad. Yeah, I don't know if he heard anything, though. Um, okay. To my knowledge, I don't think any. Okay. Um, if for any reason that you became aware of other people who may have potentially, please feel free to give us a call and we can supplement. Um, and so I was encouraged I just was curious to know um, how you heard about us and how you were directed to our office. Yeah, I, I was um I was when I was Googling around for ACP saw a news article about this. 
website, so I, I apologize. Okay. Um, what would you say best describes you? Are you a uh, resident, local visitor, visitor uh, food subsidy, uh, any sort of other city or government information? Um, for this purpose, I'll just say I was a visitor. My email is wrong. More than likely. Um, does it really be needed? It, that's just more so for our internal track. Yeah, um, these, this whole list of questions here is for us to be able to kind of identify um, what sectors of the community our complaints are coming from. Mm -hmm. So we might want to look at it by age, gender, race, or ethnicity, sexual orientation. But again, all of this is going to be if that is the yeah, Maybe later I'll give it those okay. questions. And the last question I have for you is um, whether English is your primary language. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in the event that someone says no and they need language assistance, that's when you would um, try to figure that out with the um, help. Um, so I just want to um, make sure that we uh, go through this form and that everything is correct with you. And then once we do all of that, we will um, go to the acknowledgement page. Um, and submit the form and acknowledge that everything is correct. So this, I'm not going to do it right now just for the sake of time, but this is where you would hit the back button and go back to the beginning to go through the form with the person to make sure that everything is accurate. And then it's so that sort of shows everything in the form accurate yeah. as you described it to me. Mm -hmm. right. What if I remember something later, though? Can I, can I change this? Or? Absolutely. Okay. You can always supplement with additional case notes, additional attachments, anything of that nature. You can go back um, as long as the, the investigation is still pending. Okay. okay. Um, so now, having heard you acknowledge that everything in this uh, form is accurate to the best of your knowledge, I'm going to go ahead and submit it. And this is going to be your tracking number right here. Okay. Um, you can write it down together. I'm happy mm -hmm. to email it to you. You can also create a, um, a an account, and that will give you um, automatic email updates um, on the status of your case. But at any okay. point, you want to see what Okay. Um, after this is submitted to um, Civil, we will download it and um, share it with our colleagues at ACPD who we collaborate on these investigations with. Um, we will be collaborating with them um, on this investigation all the way through the process. Um, once I have completed the collaborative investigation process, I will present the report. And I will share that report along with the evidence that we collected along the investigation, as well as ACP report. The reports are completely independent of one another, so we may not necessarily have to reach the same findings. Um, and then that would go to the Community Oversight Board. They'll discuss it and confer amongst themselves and create a separately independent report as well. Um, and so if you have any questions along the way or want to know kind of what the status of it, feel free again to use this uh, track number or reach out to our office directly and we can let you know where we're at. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your request. Right. Any questions about how to utilize the form? My only question was if they were to, like, you finish all that process and then they send you something, can you log back into Civil and upload it? Mm -hmm. okay. It just wouldn't be through that form, it would be as sort of an addendum. Right. But we're able to add case notes or any attachments, um, add or subtract the officer information. You know, they, you know, so you can use the new. Yeah. Or sometimes if we need to call that person back because we need some additional information from them, then we could do that and take those notes from that call and then send that addendum over to a form and we download all of it. So obviously you were able to ask more questions. But if they were filling it out themselves, a lot of I'm not sure a lot of people would say add race in there because there wasn't a block to race. But you were asking, so there was like one block where you put like three things in. Do you think people will automatically put those things in? Um, the description? Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. What, I'm sorry. For the officers or for the, themselves? Uh, for the officers. Well, yeah, for the officers. They, they may, and we leave it open so that they can put any sort of uh, description that they can recollect. But even, you know, 
somebody putting it in there doesn't necessarily mean that it's true, right? Like sure. They're making a guess as to what that person's race is or what have you. What what is what we're trying to do is to capture as much information as possible about where it happened, when it happened, what officers were involved, so that we can assist with um, assist ACP or give them as much information as possible to identify what officers were involved. But sometimes just the facts of the underlying incident um, can help us figure out who, what officers were involved. Like, because then there's other ways that you can go in and see, like, you know, this incident occurred, and you know, you can look at, um, you know, what what incidents, what similar factual incidents occurred in a particular area or on a particular date. Mm -hmm. and there are multiple ways to try to like narrow it down. Sure. But the more information, obviously. I think nowadays a lot of people, unless it asks for it, I'm not sure a lot of people. That's our history. Yeah. 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 And the way that we're tracking complaints in terms of like the public facing data is more so, like, if you want to look at complaints by race, um, it's going to be the race of the complaint if they decide to answer that, not necessarily for the officers for purposes of data. Um, because again, you know, that person making a guess about the race of not necessarily accurate. They may not actually identify that. So that would be something that if we wanted to factor into this, um, I think the more accurate way to get that information is. I had a quick question. Go ahead, Martin. So, um, if someone loses their tracking ID for a case, um, is there a way for them to like retrieve it or ask for um, like what it might be? Yeah, if they, if they could email us and then we provide it, but, you know, they could reach out to us in any way and they would have, we'd be able to provide it to them. Call? Yeah, call, email. I mean, All right, thank you. So um, we are trying to create an efficient system to like a one-stop shop where you all can go and see kind of what the status is of these investigations, um, whether they come in through ACP or through civil. Um, what we came up with as an interim solution is using Excel spreadsheet. We're hoping to advance this technology over time, um, especially because it requires us to manually enter this information. But for purposes of what we need to accomplish with this right now, um, we'll send out the spreadsheet or share it with you all, but I just wanted to walk through kind of what this information showcases. So it'll tell you what type of submission, where it came from, whether it was civil or ACP, and then the civil ID number that's associated with it or the OPR case number that's associated with it. And that would be when you go on to evidence.com and you see the inventory of all of the evidence that you have. That's how you could identify what evidence is in that case. Um, this will also tell you when the complaint was filed, and there's an automatic tracker to let you know how long it's that completed time. Um, it'll also include the complainant's name, the status of the investigation, and then you'll be able to see what two POC members have been assigned to that particular investigation, as well as when their breach have occurred. So there'll be one at the onset of the investigation. And There'll also be a link for you right here where you can click on and hopefully the technology works the way this works. You'll just be able to click on the link, it'll set your back to the um, And then any notes here would be my notes to you all about like where it was submitted from, or it might be, you know, some notes to how we're looking at handling the case, or just anything that I think is um, important for you all to know about this particular investigation. Um, and the Excel spreadsheet will show all of these, and then there's a separate um, page on the Excel spreadsheet that you'll notice at the bottom that says non-investigative files. So that's where we'll store information for submissions that come in that we may um, that don't necessarily fall within the purview of our investigation. Um, like some of the ones that we were talking about earlier, where there was a that. So you'll see those that information in there, and then you'll see in the notes section an explanation as to why they're not going to further investigate it. And there may be a closing memo or something like that associated with it, and that would be. Um, Where's that going to be available? We'll put it in the Teams folder, but I'll also send a link out to you all in the email. Access it 
it'll be just it'll be one file that will just be constantly updated. There won't be one file per investigation. And then that way you'll be able to see at any time how many investigations you have. Um, hopefully that just makes it a little bit easier to yeah. be able to see everything in one place and have to go on evidence.com and figure out like the yeah. pieces yeah. of the puzzle. And again, you know, we're developing this technology, so if you have suggestions along the way about how it can be used, then we definitely welcome that. Um, so again, the debrief, uh, just to recap our our opportunity to have open discussion between myself and CAB members. We broke it down into groups of two, obviously for public um, requirements. So each investigation will have two CAB members that are assigned to the case that I would have in terms of it. That being said, if at any time you all have questions about a particular via phone, email, um, we can get questions. It would just be my um, main point. Um, so again, we'll have one at the onset and one at the conclusion, unless it's a particularly complicated investigation and more debrief, but we'll at least have those two minimum. Um, the initial debrief, that would be an opportunity to just kind of share the preliminary facts, thoughts about what the investigation should look like, what are the potential allegations that we should be looking to, potential witnesses, um, and you know, for you all to ask any questions or direct me on things that you are particularly interested in paying attention to the investigation or answers or questions and things like that that you want answered um, through the course of the investigation. Um, and then during the closing debrief, I will um, share updates about what information was covered during the investigation, um, talk about highlights from the interviews and different things like that, what the final investigations, were, allegations were that were investigated and what some kind of preliminary thoughts are around the disposition for those allegations. So they're going to sustain not sustain um, and also, you know, I'll be able to give you my personal you know, um, thoughts or reflection on how I think the investigation is, um, what I'm going to write in my report in terms of what my findings are. Um, obviously, at that point, you can utilize the time to um, ask any questions or um, any sort of, uh, get any sort of additional details that you feel, that you feel will be important to you while making your own independent findings and conclusions and to begin developing a discussion guide as to what issues you all want to focus on, especially to discuss the case. Um, and also, you know, if you think that is a case that you need um, some legal counsel on or any sort of additional like protections or anything like that, that would be a good place to kind of bring those up so I can do whatever needs to happen if you need to do happen in order to um, complete the investigation. Um, so scheduling the debrief is going to be an important aspect of this, right? So have to um, make sure that we have efficient ways to do that. And I'm going to kick it over to Ian to talk about a schedule to, that us to hopefully make it easy for you all to schedule those things uh, once you've been assigned to it. Yeah, so um, this is actually through Microsoft and Monday if you want to click on the uh, thing there. So I sent this out to you all um, a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, we haven't scheduled anything yet, uh, but this is just through, it's almost like a Microsoft Forms, but it's yeah, man. Uh, essentially, this just links up. Know. It just links to our uh, Outlook calendars. Mine isn't there right now, but really, you would only be scheduling it with Honey. So, based upon her availability, uh, it would take you to this page here. You would select uh, Mummy as the staff, and it may be that the computer already defaults to Mummy, and then you would just select the date and the time based upon her. Uh, so, let's say you wanted to schedule it for. Tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m., you would select that date and time. You would add your name, email, address, et cetera, there, and then you just hit book, and it would send her a calendar invite, send you a calendar invite that time for you. So, pretty straightforward, uh, relatively simple, but if you have any questions, just send an email or call me. We're doing the debriefs separately, not doing as a pair. I mean, as a pair, that's the next thing I was uh, going to say. So, does it allow them to select more? Um, I believe you can select multiple times so that uh, I'll, I'll enable that feature. Yeah, or if you want to coordinate with the person that you're assigned to that um, investigation with and come up with a time that works well for the two of you, then one person can book it for both of you. Um, but otherwise, I can look at it and see what dates you are jointly mm -hmm. available and, and on your calendar. Um, and then you'll just any questions about utilizing the schedule? 
um, again, for hoping that these tools are going to make it easier and more efficient. But if you find that that's not the case at any point, just let us know if there's something else that you think would work better for you. Not to hurt. Um, we just want to make sure that this is as much as possible. Um, all right. So we have talked about the scheduling tool. Okay, the last thing is just looking forward um, about some things that we have on the horizon. Um, we are working with our comm staff here at the county to um, set up a kiosk essentially tool on iPads that we'll be able to take to community engagement events. We will be able to do on on-site um, complaint intake if the need arises. So we'll probably have maybe like one or two with us when we go to community engagement events. Um, we're also looking at setting up countywide intake sites, for example, um, the library. Um, we'll be setting up um, our informational flyers at different places around the county so people can um, have contact information related to how to file a complaint or how to reach our office. But there may also be instances where it would be um, helpful to have people who are on staff at that particular location to make it as accessible as possible um, that would be able to walk people through the same um, intake process that we shared with you all earlier. Um, and we would also be looking to try to do that at different community centers and places that are maybe not even associated with um, and providing those same intake materials and training to whoever those community moms are at those different centers. Um, that would just, again, make it as easy as possible for people to submit the complaint intake or compliments or whatever it is that they want to submit and be able to be in the comfort of their community or to get the emotional or language assistance or whatever it is that they need to be able to, to complete that process. Um, and then finally, we are um, developing a training with the Center for Policing Equity that is going to cover generally um, policy and data analysis, but also how the, the kind of overlap here is that as we are doing these complaint intakes, we want to be thinking about capturing the information in a way that is going to lead to more thorough, expansive policy data analysis and inform the process. So we'll talk a little bit about how that kind of overlaps to just kind of expand our um, skill set when it comes to and allow for better policy and data. That's it. Any questions? Uh, okay, for the, for the community center liaisons, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry if you uh, answered. Do you mean just the county community centers or community centers of large red house and bar? Yeah, no, at large. Okay. Not, so yeah. we're looking at county um, specific right. areas and then also non-county right. related. Right. So right. if people feel more comfortable going to something that's completely independent yeah. of the county, then that would be available okay. to them. It, it may just be their regular community mm -hmm. center that they just go to for other needs. Um, so just trying to make sure that we have um, as far of a reach. Good. Good job. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, and if you all have any suggestions about, you know, places that you think would be helpful to um, uh, ordered uh, the, the layer that I've ordered even extra ones kind of as a result of the conversation we were having um, because we have uh, printed out those materials and we can actually place them at different places around the county as well and just leave them there for people to, you know, to access that information. Those are very good materials, by the way. And then the, yeah. the display materials you have to there is very well, um, very well done. Uh, and I think they're great for uh, people have, you know, just to get to know, you know, there's a lot that we get to know us, we get to know what we do and all that. And I think the materials are great. They are now really say that. And it's right. very nice. Thank really you. Display. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that it might be good practice for us to um, develop those materials in different languages should the need mm -hmm. arise. Um, I know, like, you know, counterpart agencies and areas where there is a very strong presence of a second language, be it Spanish or what yeah. have you, they automatically translate all of their documents mm -hmm. online and in person to mm -hmm. Spanish. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we necessarily have a specific uh, language that is, you know, a, a prevalent need or, you know, you might, it might be several languages, I mm -hmm. think, in this area. Um, but that's something that I would definitely be open to as well as, um, Translating those documents for various community centers or community. That's something that spend the money on. Before. Yeah, we do it before the thirtieth. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if not, we, we have a budget for next year. So it's just that we um, didn't utilize uh, that much of our budget upcoming year um, doing training. So I try to 
um, purchase as many um, of our like kind of promotional materials or things yeah. that we'll use for community engagement. Community engagement. Yeah. 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 Yeah
then maybe we want to um, initialize a local, a different event. I mean, it may not be August, it may be September. Yeah. My recollection of Alumni Association is take off August. So, right. And but but because it probably won't have a July meeting, or well no, they'll probably just keep July meeting some sometime later in the month. So a lot do take off August. So if you don't get August, I mean maybe hopefully, you know, but if you don't, then September I think it's still good. I mean, there's not it's not really a bad channel pipeline. We may do something else also before then, but uh I would definitely try to find a date that works for their yeah. civic association. Okay. I mean, yeah, if it just doesn't, if it doesn't work for us, I just wouldn't want to say, okay, well, we want some, you know, something else. But not really. okay. Okay. I couldn't really think of it as a kickoff. If we right. To September. Yeah, yeah. I think right. It would just be another right. thing, just, just, and we find what the kickoff right yeah, would be. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Um, we'll initiate that outreach and circulate an email amongst the group, just so what we find out um, coming back. Um, aside from that, we had also discussed. For example, farmers markets and the county fair. Are there any other sort of major events that we want to put on our roster as we look to start planning these in detail? Well, you know, I just forgot to answer. But I, I'm not plugged into the Arlington Hispanic community, so I don't know where. I mean, I always say churches, but I don't know exactly where. However, there's a pretty strong uh, Hispanic liaison in ACP. They may have a really good sense of what a good location would be. I don't know if they have Santa Maria uh, churches. Is a, is a, is a, an Episcopal church that my church is affiliated with, and and it's very like we do a second language thing there, and it's it's a big congregation. It's on uh, I, I don't remember the street it's on, but I mean I could reach out and see if they were interested in you know posting something. Or, yeah, or, yeah, sure. But I, like I said, I, did, I know there's uh, officers in ACPD who sit, who are liaisons. Liaisons, specific liaisons, and they probably not not that that's not also a good idea, but they almost certainly know. I yeah. just want to be sure we don't miss yeah. them and other large groups. I don't know, like probably have a large um, population. I guess yeah. Dallas, you know, so I'm be sure we capture. Okay. But certainly the Spanish speaking community. Between now and July, why don't we take those two as an action item, reaching out to a Green Valley Civic Association, seeing if Santa Maria is interested in having us come for an event, and and just generally maybe taking it as a third action amongst ourselves to think about who else we interface with that you know we have probably told or may not have told as much about our involvement in the COB, but trying to use our own sort of personal network to gauge where there may be community interest in hearing more about what the COB is tasked with doing, how we're going about it, and whether or not there's any input. If we do an event with a, 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 a at Santa Maria, I mean, we have someone who can speak Spanish. Yeah. I speak Spanish. Okay. Gary Spanish. speaks Spanish. There's a okay. bunch of us right. who speak well, Spanish. Super. Me too. <laughs> We have enough, but okay, I mean, enough. you know, if you think we need an actual translator or something, we can. That I mean, their services are expanding, like, so I don't know. I'll follow up. I think we can speak Spanish. We can mobilize the Spanish-speaking contingent to okay. go and. That's great. Yeah. Um, I would hope that's it. Okay. Um. The next thing I wanted to address was the July meeting schedule it is for July 12th. Does anyone have a known conflict? Um, I meant to be traveling for work. Yeah, I'm going to be out of town. I don't know that we have anything yet on the agenda that would require us to have a forum. Um, so mm -hmm. I could probably participate virtually. Do we have a virtual option? Well, we could do an all virtual option, but yeah. I just wanted to get a sense of whether we have any conflict. I don't know that we need to plan for an all virtual option unless we have a, like a forum need that like if we needed to go through a, you know, an investigation or whatever. But so I just wanted to get a sense of whether 
Go fly yeah, I agree. Okay, so you and I could probably attend, or as of right now, we could both attend virtually and not create a, a okay. forum okay. or voting problem. Okay. But just let me know if any other conflicts arise and we could make that an all virtual meeting or not. Um, we'll try to get that finalized. That's the full agenda, except for open discussion. Is there anything anyone else would like to raise for group discussion? Yes, Chris, quick reminder. Oh, um, for the NACOL annual conference, is, oh, yeah. um, is there anyone else interested in going in November to the annual NACOL conference? The budget request is pending, so we don't actually have approval, but while we get that request through the works. Uh, Lisa has expressed interest in going. I would like to go, but I might have a conflict. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, just generally speaking, what I kind of talked about with um, Gary, um, but I I think that it's really um, great and very valuable for you all to have training opportunities outside of our county uh, community meetings. Understanding that you all are volunteers, that's not mandatory at all, but if there are opportunities that um, come across that you're interested in, like definitely let me know so that we can um, figure out administratively like budget and how many people we can afford to send and um, what sort of things we need to be financed related to make that happen. Um, in different conferences might be different considerations. Like NACOL is a particularly expensive one. If you're looking at somewhere around $2,500, maybe $3,000 including premium. Um, including flights, hotel, food, the registration fee, and so on. So, so for that conference, I would say that it probably would be prudent for us to spend. It also may be based on like where we're at in the how, what we have left in our budget in that particular year, right? But um, for that particular conference, I think it would be prudent to only plan on maybe like one or two people going, um, and then reporting back to the group. Um, but the sooner I know, the better, because like for right now we're getting ready to close out the 2020 cycle. If I knew, like, before the end of this month that there are two people that want to go, there are some things I could pay for on the front end that would alleviate us it being mm -hmm. completely taken out of the next year's budget. I could pay for your registration fees, flight, that sort of thing on the front end. And then some things are just going to have to come out of next year's budget, like your hotel um, and your charge for until they actually recover. Um, but also, generally speaking, we talked about maybe having a kind of budget committee that um, <clears throat> on the front end, can give insight as to you know how many community engagement events we have a year, how much training outside of the you know, our county training we want to be kind of planning for how much money we can allocate for and then um, working around that. Um, so that would be something that we can talk about, you know. And then also like sometimes we will have like free trainings or webinars and that sort of thing. So I try to pass that information to you. We will have um, free training opportunities but there might be things that you all come across that I don't. Um, so if there are things that you all find that you're interested in, definitely pass that information. I will um, do my best to make sure that we can provide those resources. So we have a training committee, right? Um, well, we're, we're that was so. Jim and, and Julia, but I think that training was initially like thinking well, about what the Arlington, like the required training. Yeah, center. required, but well, I think we expand we, that training. Well, it's really the transition. Yeah. It's really a transition, so we weren't at the meeting, so I took over. No, I didn't take over. But anyway, so this year, I'm so glad you sent that thing to NACOL because we have money right now. So we didn't plan, but that's the right thing to do. But I think what Mummy and I agree is that we really need to think because NACOL probably may not be the only thing. that might be a good one to go to, but we don't know what we don't know. Right? So I think this committee for next year's budget would be trying to make recommendations on Hey, Nate Cole, we did that last year. You know, two thumbs up, we'll do it again. Or we found out about some other things that, and we can all be searching this ourselves, right? As far as what are things to consider, and then mommy can make a budget. So this year, we don't have a budget, but we're going to go, right? That's, I mean, we have the money and we have a date to spend it by. That's how the military works. You, know, you just spend the money, even if you don't need to spend it, you spend it. But, but, but we do need a plan because I think there's other things I just don't. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. And there's 
So um, what I wanted to ask is, do you have to be at the conference for like all five days if you were to go? Um, ideally, yes, because we're paying for the full Which registration fee. Mm -hmm. um, but there may be, you know, certain, certain circumstances that it could be offset by the cost of lodging and things like that. So, but yeah. I, ideally, if you're going down there, like we'd want you to try to spend this to, yeah. to get the to take in the full networking, the full advantage of the community. I think if you had a runner back end and so you can only go for four days that would still be worth sending somebody for the budget well I, I, I she's volunteering yeah, i'd like to go yeah. what is this november, november. november. i have a conflict but i'm oh. trying to resolve it okay. you really okay. should go okay. you really should go november 12th through 16th the one thing Chicago. I think it's possible that I can go. Um, so well, I, I, I would got a cap for the the other conferences do not have cap. But generally speaking, like by the time you add like the fees and flights, because I think it should probably be a practice that we start to max unless there are certain things that I don't want. Just because I know that this year was an anomaly in terms of cap left over from the budget. Right. Future years I, I think it's a lot tighter than it has been. The other anomaly about this year is that, like, as we get started, we'll be we will have just submitted our report and be brainstorming what we want our priorities to be. So, if more than two people wanted to go this year and we're able to, I think it would be valuable recognizing that we for next year probably don't want to do ad hoc approvals. We probably want to have a plan and a list. So, um, Gary, what I was going to say is that brings me to. As far as subcommittees go, we do have a report due in September and a bunch of investigations to get through between now and then. So we need to make a plan for compiling our report and also for a policy review. But there are a couple of items that we've come across sort of in the course of this that we've raised as we may want to do some in-depth you know, review. I think the findings of our interns um, look into photo enforcement and, and other sort of related adjacent policies. Um, is something we want to make space for in our calendar. So be thinking for the next meeting and we'll look to schedule our sort of subcommittee meetings between now and the end of September. I think training will be important, but probably not a priority amongst those of the queue. We want to have our training. We want to review our training curriculum before the end of the year, but not necessarily before September. Yeah, that's a good segue. So the other, you know, we had our um, Prop 3 coming. Yeah, you weren't there, but you talked about right along next year and the recommendations. I mean, you want to talk about that just a little bit or you want to save that? This was the requirement to do right alongs. And my suggestion was that I think it's still good that we do right alongs for networking, get to know people. I just don't think it needs to be four hours. So the initial training, I think, should be the full money, but for the, you know, Recurrency thing. I, my suggestion, I think you were going to push that up, right? The, whether they were going to accept that was to keep it, you know, minimum of two or around two, you know, just so we can go in, meet the new officer, how do you, how's it going, you understand what we're doing, we're kind of getting with, but I don't think we need to. Yeah, that was my suggestion. I don't think I need three, four hour right lines for my, for my recurrency. But I do think there's value in making contact with officers and helping them know who we are, we get to know people, meet people. Because we're only in year two, so. Uh, because that's in the ordinance, let's make sure we slide that for our training sort of review. Because yeah. it is part of our MOU that the training curriculum will be something that we review and deal with. But you were going to, weren't you going to talk to somebody about that? Yeah, yeah. so I, I spoke with that Deputy Chief Chamberlain about this uh, ride-along in general. Um, just checked in with her like very briefly earlier today. 
Um, we're, she's going to circle back with me to talk about it um, next week because we're trying to figure out who the best contact person is for the ride-alongs now. Um, and also when we should do them. There, um, there is currently um, some field training officers that are like transitioning on, and we want to make sure that's like the best timing, you know, for us to start re, um, re doing these um, annual requirements for ride-alongs. Um, and then also we can talk about um, what the format should be. Like keep, the ordinance just requires currently that there are three ride-alongs, but it doesn't necessarily specify um, you know, the time or the shift. I think that it was very valuable um, by and large from everybody's experiences that they shared with me to have the opportunity to do three different shifts because they got a chance to kind of see the differences. Um, if that continues to be the case, then great. If that's not the case, then great. If the number of hours could be adjusted um, to make it where it's only two hours that are mandatory, but you're welcome to stay for the whole four hours or what have you, then that's something that we should we um, could talk about. But I, I'd like to do that in collaboration with them to yep. figure out what um, would work best for them as well and what they think would be the most valuable training. So more on that later. I'll, um, I was going to report back out to that after we have yep. a follow-up. Else? Um, we received a notice from the county about new training for staff. How do you want us to um, handle that? Mm -hmm. um, are you all? It would be in the learning center. Yeah. Um, it really is a good question, though, because I'm not sure that it was anticipated that you all will have to continue with and keep up with us. I think it's implied, but I can just mm -hmm. confirm that to make sure that the, that continues to be a requirement. On local and getting going to the network is a hit or miss. So if I'm just, if I'm, or even if like before our meetings, if I can go in, do you know, check the email, yeah. do yeah. Uh, training or whatever. Um, do we have access to that? I think that we could figure out a way to do that. You have to have a county badge to swipe into one of the rooms, but if we alerted security or reserved that room ahead of time, which is saying it's spontaneous when we did it, um, we could probably let security know. We could probably swipe in a badge or one of our um, But I just need to confer with security to figure out the best, the most efficient way to go. Of course, you know in advance if you go to the But if it's the spontaneous room, it's if you wanted a private space, you could probably figure that out. There's plenty of spaces. I just need to figure out your access to the badge. Okay. Having addressed all the agenda items, I declare the meeting adjourned, and we will uh, see you all in July. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good note. Thanks for <laughs>